Khan's video confession makes no actual reference to him blowing himself up. It's said by people who knew him to show him several years ago and has never been shown in its entirety. Since the narrative's release, we've also seen a video by Shazad Tanweer. Again, Tanweer makes no reference to his suicide and we have never seen the whole film. Even if these videos are genuine, they are not evidence that the men were responsible for the London bombings. If there is no evidence of remote detonation at the bomb sites, why did the New York police, based on what the British police had told them, report at a conference that the bombs were set off using mobile phones, the same remote timing devices used in the Madrid bombings in 2004? The eyewitness accounts of the bombers fiddling with their rucksacks are extremely dubious. The first, reported widely across the international press soon after the attack, came from a Mr Richard Jones, who claims to have seen a man fiddling with his bag on the bottom floor of the number 30 bus. He described the man he saw as clean-shaven and wearing light brown trousers and a light brown top, so obviously he wasn't talking about Hussein. The second was Danny Biddle, badly injured in the Edgware Road bomb. Six months after the attacks, he told a newspaper that he had actually seen Khan before he blew himself up. We are not suggesting that Biddle lied, but we are suggesting that someone who is paid to tell their story six months after the event is not a reliable enough witness to be a central piece of evidence in the official government report concerning the attacks. As for the CCTV recordings, where are they? No CCTV footage has been released to the public. All we have seen are three still images. One shows Hussein alone entering the ticket hall at Luton Station, inexplicably cropped so it does not show the other three men who should all be around him. The second shows Hussein, again alone, outside Boots and King's Cross Station, apparently at 9am, ten minutes after he was supposed to be dead and at a time when King's Cross Station was being evacuated. And the third shows four figures entering Luton Station, three of whom have blurred faces, so only Hussein is actually identifiable. There are no images of the four men together in London. In fact, there are no images of any of the train bombers in London that day at all. As the police themselves emphasised, the men should have been filmed by CCTV cameras along the whole route, capturing literally thousands of images of their journey. Or perhaps, like the cameras on the number 30 bus, all those cameras just weren't working that day. The car in which they travelled to Luton is said to have contained explosive devices but it's never been explained why the men would have left them there when embarking on a suicide mission. The devices were reportedly destroyed in controlled explosions. These photos appeared on ABC News in America, but for some reason they were never officially released in the UK. And then there is the forensic and DNA evidence apparently identifying the four men at the bomb sites, which again has never been presented to the public for proper scrutiny. And the fact that the police tell us that they have the evidence, and that it is convincing, unfortunately does not mean that they do, or that it is. The past record of the British police in catching and honestly convicting the real perpetrators of bombings in the UK is appalling. Instead, in numerous cases it has been shown that the police deliberately tampered with evidence, forced confessions out of suspects, and withheld information that would clear them. You think we're exaggerating? Then go on the internet and look up the following. The Birmingham Six. The Guildford Four. The Maguire Seven. Judith Ward Danny McNamee More recently, we have seen the police in action with the death of Jean de Menezes in Stockwell Station. having killed an innocent man for no reason other than they thought he was someone else, who they also should not have killed. They responded to the outcry with a string of lies and deception. And despite all the investigations, 
no police officer was charged or punished in any way for the murder. And even more recently, we've seen another innocent man shot. This time, as he came down the stairs in his pyjamas after his house had been raided by 250 policemen looking for chemical weapons that turned out not to be there, despite there being what the police later described as compelling evidence. So if you genuinely believed it was unlikely or even impossible that the police would ever fabricate evidence in order to give the appearance of having solved a crime, it is time to reassess your belief. They have, they do, and they will again. If we learn one thing from these incidents, it is this. The police view themselves as above the law. And if we learn another thing, it is that they are. In the wake of the bombs, Britain has been left a changed nation. Already the country with the most surveillance in the world, the UK is set to move further towards a literal Big Brother society. Tony Blair said at the 2005 Labour Party conference, We know we need strict controls in a changing world. Really, Tony? We know we need strict controls? Exactly who do you mean by we? The British public? The government and police? Or you and your friends? And how exactly are these strict controls going to stop potential terrorists being aggrieved by our foreign policy? And how would these controls have prevented the attacks in London? We have just been fortunate enough to see these strict controls in their true light during the latest terrorist threat, which played out across the UK like an Orwellian pantomime. On the 10th of August, 24 supposed terrorists were arrested. They were allegedly just about to blow up 10 planes in mid-air using liquid explosives, despite the fact they had no bombs, no plane tickets, and several of them didn't even have passports. With the threat apparently foiled, the terrorist alert level immediately went up to critical, indicating